most of the book is about the Trump impeachment trial, but that's not the case. You cover a lot of topics in the book. I mean, the Trump impeachment trial, the, the one about Ukraine, was covered so thoroughly by so many news outlets. Writing yet another version of it, to me, I felt was tiresome. Nobody wanted to read it. If they wanted to know what happened, the transcript is there. There's lots of left and right opinions on what happened and what should have happened. And it's like, I can't add to that conversation. I did cover it in the book because to leave it out would have been completely disingenuous, but that's not what the book was really focused on. Yeah, it's interesting because you talk a lot about the attitude you needed to serve effectively as a representative of the US to the EU, and I gather that attitude and your focus and drive and ambition was something that you developed at a very young age. You were a first generation American mm -hmm. immigrant. Parents survived the Holocaust, came, escaped Germany to survive the Holocaust, thank goodness. And, and tell us a little bit about your early life where you developed that drive. Well, okay. my parents came to the United States with very little. And uh, because of certain circumstances, I wound up growing up in a place in Washington State called Mercer Island, which today is considered a very wealthy enclave. Uh, it's considered the Beverly Hills of, you know, of the Seattle area. When I grew up there, there were parts of Mercer Island that were very wealthy, and there were parts of Mercer Island that were very lower middle class. So I grew up obviously in the lower middle class part and my parents wisely moved there because this, the public schools were the best schools in the state, some of the best schools in the country. Uh, and you know, envy drove me. Uh, and envy is a powerful motivator. When you're with kids in school, they turn 16, they get a new car, they go to Hawaii for every vacation or to Europe and my parents couldn't afford that. So, you know, whether it was conscious or subconscious, envy got me thinking about how am I gonna make money, what am I gonna do, and I was really focused on that goal because I wanted to live that life. It's interesting to me because you seem to suggest in the book, and I may be reading too much into this, but um, it, smarts are important, you're obviously bright, but um, ambition and focus are as important, if not more important, to success. Talk about, I mean, from a business perspective, where you ended up as a public servant, um, your world view in terms of the type of people you wanted to work with. Well, there's a there's an old cliche. I certainly would never claim authorship of it, but I, I think it's brilliant, which is that execution eats strategy for breakfast. And if you think about that phrase, execution eats strategy for breakfast. Everyone likes to strategize, and everyone likes to say, well, we should do this, and we should do that, and we should, or you should, or they should. All day long you hear that. The question is, who's actually doing it? Who is actually picking up the oar and rowing? Because going from a strategic perspective to an execution perspective means that you step to start now gaming out the steps. What am I going to do to make that brilliant idea happen? And that could be picking up the phone and making a call. It could be getting in your car and going to see somebody. There's a lot of things that require, and nobody wants to execute. Everyone wants to strategize. So that, I learned that at a very early age, that the executors are the ones that generally succeed and the strategists are a dime a dozen because everyone has a brilliant idea. It doesn't take a lot of energy to have a brilliant idea. How did that apply in your service as ambassador? Give us an example of execution defeating strategy. Well, I looked at my role. I was offered two different roles. Uh, and it's a funny story because I tried so hard for 40 years to get an ambassadorship. <clears throat> when President George W. Bush ran, I supported him. Uh, I did not, I was not as heavily involved in the campaign to warrant getting an ambassadorship, and even had he offered me one, uh, my business wasn't at a point back in 2000 where I would have been comfortable leaving it. I was just in the growth mode. And then John McCain ran for president, I supported him, and had he won, I may have been offered something, I don't know, you never know. Same with Senator Romney, Governor Romney, I supported him, worked on his campaign. 
worked with you on, on Jeb's campaign had Jeb won. Again, I have no idea if I would have been offered a, a position or not. And then finally, uh, President Trump uh, was elected. And this is a job that when you're up to bat, you don't turn it down because you, it's like being asked to go to the moon. You never know when the next invitation or if the next invitation will ever come. So I was shocked when I got a phone call well into the Trump administration a year in, and they said, the president met you. There's an anecdote in the book where I kind of poked at him a little bit, and he remembered that because I was pretty blunt with him. I told him he was a dick. <laughs> and only Trump would respond, well, why, 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 what did I do? Why was I a dick? And I said, because you blew me off when I first met you, and then the next day you saw me sitting with a bunch of people, and you came up and you couldn't have been nicer, and you said, well, the reason I was nice to you the second time was because you were with very important people. <laughs> and I said, well, who says that? <laughs> They kind of laugh because he is self-aware. He knows he's a dick. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I, I digress. Uh, <laughs> so when when I was offered when I was offered the job, I I was told you can have either an ambassadorship to a European country, and I'm not going to tell you which because I don't want to. Um, make the person who got the ambassadorship feel bad. It's a very important ambassadorship. Or you can have the EU. And I said, are you kidding? And they said, no, but you need to get back to us within 72 hours. So my first phone call was to President George W. Bush, uh, who I know loathed Donald Trump. So I had two questions for him. A, should I do this at all? And B, which one should I take? And so I reached out to President Bush. Uh, he very kindly got right back to me. And he said, well, Gordo, uh, what do you want? Chicken salad or chicken shit? <laughs> and I said, which is which? <laughs> and he said, no, seriously. He said, the other ambassadorship will have a great time, will entertain, it's a nice house. Uh, I appointed some very close friends to that ambassadorship. He said, but if you want a real working ambassadorship where you're going to work your ass off seven days a week, that's the EU. And if, if that's where you want to go and that's what you want to do, I will introduce you to the gentleman who did that job for me when I was president. You guys should get together right away and talk about it. So I got back to my contact in the Trump administration. I said, I'm going to take you. Can you talk a little bit about um, the, you, you mentioned two types of ambassadors, two paths to ambassadorships that exist in the United States. One being someone who's very involved on behalf of uh, someone who becomes president, and other that is a career path. Can you talk about those two paths and specifically the career path in case people don't understand the difference? Or? Well, the State Department is very much almost like, it, it's a, a hierarchy like a military organization. And foreign service officers, they're called officers, start at the bottom, and they have different titles that actually equate to ranks in the military. They start out basically as first lieutenants, and then they work their way up to four-star general. And a four-star general is a career ambassador. And there are only a handful of those people out of the 60,000 or so people in the State Department. And they spend years uh, being educated at prestigious universities, unlike me, uh, Georgetown, Stanford, various schools that specialize in, in the foreign service and foreign policy, international relations. And it's, it, you know, it's a long, long career of traveling around the world, being posted. And it's an up or out hierarchy. If you don't progress, it's like a law firm. If you don't progress upward, you're generally encouraged to leave because the stasis is not good for career. Then you have these people who come in from nowhere who are political appointees, a la me, who have no foreign policy experience, nothing other than we know the president, we have business, generally have business experience and life experience, and we're plugged into this system with three to four stars on our shoulder day one. It would literally be like entering the military and having all these officers go, how'd that guy become a general? 
I've been here for 30 years, I'm still a colonel. You know, and there's a lot of envy, there's a lot of resentment. And it's probably well placed on the surface for them to feel that way. But remember, the ambassador is the stand-in for the President of the United States wherever he or she are posted. They are the highest ranking official in that country or in that venue when the president is not there. So all of the people that work for the US government in that place work for the ambassador. They do not work for Washington, DC. So when you think about it in that, through that lens, and you talk to a foreign leader, the president of fill in the blank country, and you say, Mr. President or Madam President, I have a choice for you. We have candidate A who has been a career foreign service officer, knows everything there is to know about your country. They know the history, they know the culture, they speak the language fluently, and they are a career foreign service officer and they are an expert on that country. Candidate B is a um, car manufacturer who knows very little about your country, does not speak your language, smart businessman or woman, very successful career, uh, and they're up to bat. Which would you prefer? And 90% of those foreign leaders would pick candidate B. And the reason is because candidate B can pick up the telephone and call the President of the United States. Candidate A cannot. And that's what that foreign leader wants. They want the access to the White House. And that's interesting. It brings me to the point in your book where you decided pretty early on in order to be effective um, on behalf of our country and to advance U.S. interests with respect to the EU. You had to get Trump's attention, and you were going to have to go around the chain of command and the staff, and you meet them on the tarmac at a NATO summit, right? Can you set that up for us and talk about how you got his attention and ended up in the limo with him early on in your ambassadorship? I will. Um, so, one of the reasons our confirmation, the ambassador to Belgium and I were both confirmed at the same time, and the, we were able to persuade the Senate, who was sitting on a lot of confirmations. People had already been vetted, had gone through the process, and the Foreign Relations Committee and the full Senate were just sitting on these. And we were able to persuade the Senate leadership to put us through, if they were going to anyway, now, because the NATO summit was quickly approaching and the president was coming to Brussels and they needed a EU ambassador, they needed a Belgian ambassador, the NATO ambassador had already been appointed, that was K. Bailey Hutchison uh, from Texas. So the Senate said, okay, 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 and they confirmed us. And so the next time I saw Trump, after I told him he was a dick, which was you know, six months prior, eight months prior, was in Belgium. And I was told by the staff, they gave us a whole briefing, the president's gonna come, he's gonna land, the plane's gonna pull up, you're gonna be in your car with your driver and your security people, and you're gonna join the president's motorcade, and they must have said at least five times, do not get into the car with the president. You get in your car, he will get in his car, the motorcade will go to the first place that you're all going to, and then if you want to talk to the president, that's the place to, to talk to him. And there'll be a lot of people there as well. So I'm thinking to myself, I've been here two weeks. There are already four or five things that I've identified that rise to what I thought was the presidential decision-making level. Because I wanted to get these things done, either going or killed or whatever he wanted. And I was always, looking at things urgently like a business person does. I mean, I'm sort of a check your watch, not your calendar kind of a, a person. I mean, I have a limited amount of time. The president has a limited amount of time. Four years can go by just like that, and we were already a year in. So I didn't want to wait months and months and months to have these decisions sort of bubble up through the bureaucracy and so on and so forth. So, um, we were standing there, it's a beautiful sunny day, the Air Force One lands, there's lots of Secret Service, and I'm there with the ambassador to Belgium and the ambassador to NATO, because we're all 
Street in Brussels. And we're standing in a receiving line with other dignitaries. And the aides come by just as the plane is pulling up. And they said, remember, shake hands, say hello, get in your own cars. God. So I said, I'm not getting in my own car. <laughs> I got to talk to Trump. I have things I want to talk to him about. And there's no way I'm going to talk to him at some big reception where we're going to. And then he's got meetings, and he's going to leave. So I go, how am I going to get his attention? And I just kind of thought through it, and I said, OK, I'm going to try this. So he comes down the stairs, and I could just tell just by looking at him. And he was quite a distance away, because it's a big airplane. And I could tell he was bored, and he wasn't really excited to be there. He doesn't like NATO. You know, he was kind of cranky. He was just being polite, going through the motions. Melania was with him, a huge amount of staff. So he goes down the receiving line. I'm the last person in the receiving line. And everyone's basically greeting him the same way. Welcome to Brussels, Mr. President. It's so nice to have you here. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. He gets to me, he goes, ah! Oh, the new ambassador to the EU, how is it going? And I said, well, to tell you the truth, Mr. President, my balls are sore. <laughs> Melania is standing right next to him. She kind of smiles. And he goes, what? just like the same way he said, why am I a dick? He said, why are your balls sore? And I said, well, I've been here for two weeks, and the Europeans have been kicking the shit out of them every day. And he says, hmm, get in the car. I want to talk to you. So all of these aides who told me repeatedly, do not get in the car, or, hey, told me to get in the car. <laughs> so I had my 25 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever the car ride was, and I clicked through my list. I got decisions right there in the car. I got phone numbers to call. At that point, I said, look, I've only been at this two weeks. If you want me here giving parties, entertaining, it's a nice house, beautiful office, lots of staff, I can have a great time. Or do you want me to get shit done for you? He said, no, 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 I want you to get stuff done. I said, then I have to talk to you. I said, there's no way I can get this stuff done with that. There's nobody that can make this decision with you. And he said, what about Pompeo? I said, well, I can talk to Pompeo, but Pompeo's going to come talk to you. What do you want me to do? And he said, call me. And he gave me phone numbers, and that was the end of it. So now I have direct access. I talked to Pompeo. Pompeo said, just keep me in the loop. If he wants you to talk to him directly, just let me know what you're talking about so that I'm not blindsided, which I was very you know, copious about doing that. And it worked. it worked really well. And he made some pretty big decisions really quickly. And they were sound, because he had the right instincts. I love that story. So there's a lot of humor in this book, as you might guess. There's one line that I laughed out loud at. You're talking about the State Department budget and how level diplomats and how challenging that can be. And you say, a State Department budget is not sufficient for entertaining a high level diplomat unless your idea of fine hors d'oeuvres is a plate of Pringles and a can of cheese whisk. <laughs> What's it really like that? Exactly. How much did, did you have to come out of pocket occasionally for events, or how does what's the process to do an event? The the it's the it is the most ridiculous arcane process because there's some sort of um, rectitude when it comes to entertaining. Like you can spend unlimited amounts of money flying around on airplanes or with the security staff or with your offices, but somehow food and drink uh, are lightning rods. So they're very, very, very uh, penurious when it comes to food and drinks. And I'm not going to invite anyone to anything unless it's done properly. I just can't. So I wound up spending out of my pocket for this entire ambassadorship. I added it up, including my own first class transportation, because I wasn't going to fly on the flights they wanted me on. I wanted to fly when I wanted to fly. I spent about a million two to a million five somewhere in there on my own, uh, out of my own pocket, which is not tax deductible and not reimbursable. So. That's fascinating. So you call our relationship with Europe out of whack. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, look, Europe is a fully developed entity now. Um, it's a long road since Reconstruction after World War II. Uh, they have more people than we do. 
Uh, they have more GDP collectively than we do, and we still treat them, and they like to be treated in some quarters as sort of the weak uh, sibling. Uh, unless it comes to regulatory issues, in which case they want to set all the rules uh, and call all the shots. And Trump correctly identified, and of course he put it in very crude, sort of simplistic ways, but he said, we're getting screwed. And it's not that we're getting screwed. Having a dependable democ democratic group of countries, 27 now, there were 28 when I was there because Brexit hadn't been completed. It, it was completed on my, during my post, um, is in our interest. But it's also in our interest that the balance of trade be fair. There was always a big trade gap between what we would sell them and what they would sell us. Uh, close to 200 billion a year, depending on how you did the economy. And Trump said, look, this, this has got to stop. Our markets are wide open to you, your markets are not wide open to us. You know, they wanted to set the standards on seat belts and on how food was processed. And I remember an anecdote that sort of brought the whole thing home to me. I don't know if you remember this from the book. I had a group of 20 uh, men and women in for lunch. They were called the European Round Table. And that's very much like the business round table in the United States. It's the CEOs of the largest European com companies and all of the household names that you know, whether it's Daimler, whether it's Airbus, whether it's you know the drug companies. So these were the top men and women business leaders. And we sat down, and I was always very informal, like I'm being with you now, and I would get around with these people. They weren't used to that. They were always used to very solemn, stiff forms. So as they were digging into their salads, I said, I have a question for you guys. And they all, yes. I said, how many of you guys have a place in the United States? Like a condo, a house, an apartment, whatever, that you own? 100%. Everybody at the table had a place in there which I would have fully expected. They're running global businesses. They're in the United States all the time. I said, well then, let me understand something. How does this work? You fly your corporate jet to the US to go stay in your house in New York or in Florida or wherever your house is. And then you have, does another jet fly all your food over and your medicine and bring your car over? Because of course the United States, food is not safe. Our cars are not safe. Our medicine isn't safe. How do you do that? And they all looked at each other and they started laughing because they knew exactly you know, where I was going with this. And the chairman of Volvo said, Mr. Ambassador, let's cut the bullshit. This is all protectionism on the part of, of Europe. This has nothing to do with safety. Your stuff is as good and as safe. We drive American cars when we're in America. We eat American food. We take American drugs you know, when we're sick. This is all about protectionism. And that really, when, when the Europeans themselves are basically owning up to that, that tells you all you need to know. And Trump had identified that early on in his presidency. So my job was to cut down the amount of protectionism that existed. And I was met with some limited success. These are, you know, these French farmers are never, ever going to give up on their beautiful organically grown tomatoes. They're not gonna let the US ship our mass produced, bigger, uglier tomatoes into France without a fight. And that was a fight I was willing to, to have. You were also pretty involved in the percentage of contributions that these, the EU member countries were making to NATO, right? Because that was an issue. So that came up while you were ambassador? Because there was some progress made on that. It did, I mean, Trump, basically did something that every other president, Democrat and Republican, tried to do diplomatically, gently, and subtly by encouraging the European members of NATO to contribute their promised 2% of their GDP. And the members responded the way they respond, which is, yes, Mr. President, that's a very good idea. We will discuss that at our next blah, 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 and nothing ever happened. And this, you could go back as far as Reagan. Uh, Trump was the first one, on both sides of the aisle, by the way, Trump was the first one that said, all right, boys and girls, enough. 
we're writing the checks, you're skating on our, our, our largesse, everybody kick in their 2% or we're, we're out of here. Was he really gonna pull the US out of NATO? No. But he was just unpredictable enough that they didn't want to find out. So it caused Germany, it caused France, it caused Italy, it caused a lot of countries. They didn't all quite go to 2%, but whatever they were doing after Trump finished with them, they were doing a lot more. And even Jan Stoltenberg, who is the Secretary General of NATO, who is not a big fan of Trump's, one day came to me and we were standing by a wall during a meeting and he said, guy's the best goddamn news collector I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> So did you find yourself a lot ambassador having to go behind Trump and sort of say he didn't really mean that? Or did his willingness to sort of go there actually help you, put you in a better, stronger position? That's a really good question, Sally. I did not I did the opposite. I said he meant it even more than what you think he meant. Uh, because I was able to take advantage of a comment he would make. I'll give you a great example. It's, it's, it's a classic example. And this is where... I got to a point of where I had enough confidence in, I wasn't Ray R. O'Reilly from MASH where I could finish his sentences, but I knew how he would respond to certain issues that would arise. So when the Boeing 737 MAX had the two tragic accidents and was grounded immediately by all of the um, authorities, the FAA, EASA, which is the European version of the FAA and others. Uh, the goal was to immediately figure out what happened and get that airplane flying again. It was an enormous issue for our GDP, for Boeing's survival, et cetera, et cetera. And one of my portfolios was running the Federal Aviation Administration in Europe. We had a complete FAA department there, coordinating between the United States and Europe in terms of air traffic going across the Atlantic, et cetera, et cetera. The benefit I had in that case, even though I am a college dropout, is I'm a close to a 10,000 hour airline transport pilot, so I do understand, I've flown those airplanes, I know how they operate, I know what was going on. So I was coming to that issue with a little more than just, you know, knowledge from what I read in the papers. So I got wind from one of the FAA, senior FAA people, that this has now gone past the safety concern which everyone had a concern. No one wanted that airplane to fly until they figured out what had happened. But IASA, who is very closely aligned, of course, with Airbus, Boeing's arch enemy competitor, was trying to make more out of it than just a safety issue in order to advantage uh, Airbus. And I heard this in a meeting, and I picked up on it for some reason, and it really fried me. And I knew what would happen if I picked up the phone and called the president and told him this was going on. So I said, you know, I'm going to show a set of, you know what, and I'm going to just do this on my own because I'm 99.999% sure he'll back me up. And if he doesn't, he can fire me. So I called the FAA person, this woman who was very senior, very smart woman, and I said, who's the head of IASA? And she told me, I said, I want an appointment with, with him. And I want to talk to him. So she took like a week to arrange an appointment. What do you want to talk about? I said, I want to talk about the Max. We're already working on that. I said, I want to talk to him. And I want to talk to him in person. I don't want over the phone, Zoom, none of that. So he finally agrees to a meeting. I could tell he wasn't excited about it. I went to see him. I said, listen, Patrick, this is a deal. If there's a safety issue with this airplane, we're all ears. If we've missed something, if the FAA has screwed something up, if your engineers are smarter than ours, great. I'll have a team come over tomorrow and meet with you, whatever. We want no shortcuts when it comes to safety. However, if this is motivated by Airbus wanting to sneak up on Boeing's market share while they're suffering this misfortune, I can tell you the president the next time an Airbus has a flat tire at Kennedy Airport, the entire Airbus fleet's going to be grounded in the United States. I made that up out of thin air. <laughs> if I had said that representing Barack Obama or George Bush, the guy would have probably looked at me and said, yes, Mr. Ambassador, and then when I left,
left, he would have said, but I'm sure it was not going to happen. When it came to Trump, because Trump was so bombastic and so sort of bull in a china shop, he didn't want to find out whether I was making this up or whether it was genuine. And I added some embellishments to really make it clear that that's what the president told me to tell him. And two weeks later, the FAA lady comes in to talk to me. We had a regular meeting. She said, they're all over the safety thing. I haven't heard another peep about you know, the EASA issue that I brought. So you clearly landed something there. And then at least another month or month and a half went by. I was in Washington. I was at the White House for some completely unrelated thing. And Trump was walking by. I said, two seconds, what? I said, on your behalf, I threatened to ground the Airbus fleet because they were screwing with us on the Boeing airplane. He said, you did what? And I, so I told him the story very quickly. He goes, good, I would have done the same thing. <laughs> so I said, if you get a call from anybody in Europe, like, are you, you better not get it. He said, I got it, I got it. Right. So can we talk Ukraine just a minute? Sure. You were ahead of your time in many ways. You reached out to, when you knew the previous president of Ukraine, you reached out to Zelensky. Ukraine was not in the EU, but you clearly saw them as pivotal to the relationship the U.S. had with Europe. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I was accused by the media when the whole impeachment thing and the whole Ukraine thing blew up. I mean, why was I even involved in Ukraine? Ukraine is not an EU country. That shouldn't be in my portfolio. Yet, interestingly enough, when I was going to ambassador school, which all of us have to go to before we become ambassadors, it's a month-long sort of they call it charm school. Um, I obviously didn't learn anything um, <laughs> in Washington, D.C. Then they give you a custom-made notebook for your particular country or entity that you're going to be the ambassador to. And that has the very specific micro issues that you have to deal with. Everyone's notebook was obviously different because everyone, you know, the guy going to Norway had a different notebook than the woman going to Poland. And I had the EU notebook. And interestingly enough, Ukraine was all over that notebook, as prepared by the career, ongoing foreign service professionals. And their point was, as the ambassador to the EU, one of your jobs is to keep the Europeans as closely aligned with us as possible, because that will deter the Russians from incursions into so one of the first meetings that they set up for me when I became ambassador, within the first week or two, was with the foreign minister of Ukraine. And that was not a meeting I asked for. They suggested it, and I said, of course. Until I sort of learned the job, I was going to take their advice and meet with the people they suggested I meet with. And so you know, I, I did an interview in the media, and I said, this is complete bullshit. I said, I didn't make this up with Ukraine. The State Department wanted me to deal with Ukraine. And of course, once we went there for Zelensky's inauguration, there was a delegation that included myself, uh, former Ambassador Kurt Volker, who was the former ambassador to NATO, who was the special envoy to Ukraine, uh, Secretary Perry, because he was the energy secretary, and Ukraine uh, was a big uh, energy transfer hub. So the three of us went to Zelensky's inauguration. We spent a whole day with him, and of course, we had no idea how tough this guy was. We were very impressed with him. Uh, he was charming, he was smart, he was funny, he was quick. And we all walked out of these meetings, got on the plane to go back, and we said, you know, Trump is going to love this guy. We need to get he and Trump together as soon as possible, just to meet, with no preconditions. Because the minute they meet with each other, they're going to get along. Trump will like him, he's funny, he could have a, you know, kind of a vulgar sense of humor when asked. And once Trump liked someone, then good things would happen to that, to that country. And that's all we were trying to do, was get the two of them to, together with nothing else. And then, of course, as this thing morphed into a much bigger deal, and Rudy Giuliani got involved, much to our, our chagrin, all of a sudden uh, it became uh, a cause celeb, which it didn't need to be at all. It was a very simple, just meet this guy. He is really good. But we had no idea how good he was until this war broke. Did you see, I mean, you really seem to understand the significance of the war vis-a-vis -vis our relationship with the Russians and China and the EU. And so 
you continue to stay in touch with Zelensky. There's actually an interesting, speaking of Jay Leno being in town tonight, an interesting event that you threw where you got Zelensky and Jay Leno together. Can you talk about that? Well, again, sort of going out of my lane because hierarchy is very critical uh, in diplomacy. Presidents meet with presidents, ambassadors meet with ambassadors, assistant secretaries meet with assistant secretaries, and everybody is very conscious of their rank. Uh, I viewed my rank as the stand-in for the president. I wasn't saying I was the president. I was saying I was his, his agent, his proxy. And so I thought, you know, the way to get the EU lashed up with Zelensky, because he doesn't really know a lot of these leaders, is to figure out, because no one's going to do this, and if they do it, it's going to take years. By then, I'm gone. He's not president anymore. <coughs> Things move very slowly in the government, if you hadn't noticed. Um, so I basically took it upon myself to create a dinner where I invited every foreign leader I could get my hands on by using our bilateral ambassadors to those countries. And I created one of these complete nonsensical things where I would call this foreign leader and say, that foreign leader is coming and really is interested in seeing you, so could you, I assume they had something on their calendar, could you reschedule whatever you have that night and come to Brussels? And then I'd call you and say, that foreign leader would like to see you. And so, I did pretty well. I had about six foreign leaders there. I had some senior officials from the White House. I had Zelensky and his team. And we had about 30 people around the table. And I said, okay, this is gonna be an informal deal. This is not a formal state thing. This is so everyone gets to know Vladimir. So everyone's on a first name basis tonight. I'm Gordon, he's Vladimir, you're Andre. That was Andre Duda, the president of Poland. And everyone exchanged cell phone numbers. The staff went crazy because they don't want to be cut out of the process. And when people give each other their cell phone numbers, guess what? They just pick up their phone and call the other leader and they don't go through their staff. And it was the most effective thing I could have possibly done. And in fact, Phil Reeker, who is a very well-known career diplomat, who was the assistant secretary that I technically reported to, um, basically wrote an email saying this was of historic importance and probably one of the most important things that has happened in this whole relationship. And he has the context because he's been doing this for 30 years. I'm the new guy. But I instinctively realized when I saw Zelensky going off in a corner with Andrzej Duda, the president of Poland, and they were whispering to each other and I could see they were exchanging notes or cards or numbers or whatever, now it's Duda that's been helping Zelensky during this time of crisis. I mean, they've become friends. So being a convener is important, and cutting through the hierarchy is important as well. And how did you get Zelensky and Jay Leno together? Well, <laughs> once, I had, once I had all of that, I, I knew because Zelensky was a professional comedian, and he always admired. In fact, when I was at the inauguration, I said, do you know Jay Leno? He said, I met him once at a performance. I'm a huge fan. He's been one of the most financially successful people ever in the comedy business. I said, he was a very close friend of mine. I'd love to bring him to Ukraine sometime. Oh my God, I'd throw the red carpet if he comes, please. So when I had this dinner pretty much set in Brussels, I called Leno and I said, listen, this guy Zelensky, he says, yeah, yeah, I know who he is. I said, he wants to meet you. And he goes, what are the dates? Yeah, I'm booked. I, I said, Jay, I don't care if you're booked. you got to come for this. And he did whatever he had to do and moved the stuff around and came for. Came out for three days. And uh, he was great. He sat at that table with all those foreign leaders. And the thing about Leno is he's very smart. He reads voraciously. He understands foreign policy. He could be an ambassador in the drop of a hat if he wanted to. Uh, because he's that he's that well read and that well versed. Plus, he's very likable. So he did a great job in kind of helping people, facilitating a lot of the, the discussion that evening. And the dinner went on a long time. People are having fun. Great story. So, at what point did you realize Jesus. I might have to testify in the impeachment trial? I mean, at what point did you think, okay? This is going in a direction I didn't anticipate. You mentioned Giuliani and the desire that he not be involved.
involved in? What is involved? I mean, can you walk us through that, the lead up to that? Yeah, I mean, very simply, uh, I was shocked when the news broke that uh, there was a whistleblower complaint about some phone call that I wasn't on. I was told that the call was fine. Those who listened in on it said, yeah, it was a typical call. The president asked Zelensky to do him a favor. And, you know, no one thought it was a big deal, but this whistleblower turned it into, you know, uh, you know the crime of the century. And my name was mentioned, and I was shocked because I, you know, I wasn't on that call, but my name was mentioned in the context of I'm involved with Ukraine, I'm involved in this and that. And you know, once you know who the whistleblower is, then the whole thing makes sense. But when I was asked to testify, I was asked to testify voluntarily. And I can say this with fairly good conviction that I was, if not the only witness, one of the few witnesses that had no agenda whatsoever vis-a-vis -vis the testimony or vis-a-vis -vis President Trump. I wasn't there to help him, and I wasn't there to hurt him. I was just there to tell what happened, what I knew, directly or indirectly, answer the questions. I wanted to get back to work. Most of the other witnesses had, a, had an agenda. They were there to undermine him. They didn't like him. They were disgruntled. They were going to leave the administration or had left the administration, and they wanted to throw him under the bus. I wasn't trying to protect him from the bus. If something had happened that, truthfully, I could say, yes, he, he screwed up on this, I did it. I just put it out there. Um, so the first time I was asked to testify, I, of course, deferred to my employer. It was the State Department. I said, I've been called by Congress. What should I do? And the State Department legal team said, don't go. He wrote back to Congress and said, my employer won't let me come. So then they followed it up with a subpoena. Hmm. And then we went back to my employer again. Now we have a subpoena. What do you want me to do? Uh, they said, well, now you, you have to decide what you want to do. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> I work for you. You tell me. If you tell me not to go until the Supreme Court tells me I have to go, then I'll do that. If you tell me to go, then I'll go. And they said, no, you make up your own mind. So I looked at my lawyers. I had a very capable legal team that I had to pay for out of my pocket, and uh, which the State Department promised to reimburse me for. They never did. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, you can't ignore a, a legitimate subpoena. You have to go. So we told the White House and the State Department, last chance, are you sure you don't want to block this? Because I really don't want to be part of this service. I want to be in Brussels doing my job. I was really making some progress. I was getting some stuff done. I don't want, any, I want nothing to do with this. And they said, no, we're not going to block you. You do what you think you have to do. So I went. And I testified. And I told the truth to the best of my ability to recall. And when I couldn't recall exactly what happened, I would say, don't recall. Were you surprised at the response to your testimony? Or did you know going into it that it would be seen as such a big deal? No, I mean, look, the Republicans thought that I would be there to run interference for the president and downplay anything that happened that might have a negative impact on the president. And the Democrats thought that the reason I was there, consistent with some of the other witnesses, was that I was going to help their impeachment case. I'm sorry? No, he keeps talking. That's okay. Um, so the reality was I wasn't there to do either. I wasn't there to, as I said before, I wasn't there to help or hurt the president. And so once I testified, I had to testify twice, once behind closed doors, and then that was released, and then I had to testify in public. And there was a huge hue and cry about the fact that I changed my testimony once other people testified. And it's true, I did change my testimony on a couple of key things. And all of you who know how the human memory works, if someone says to you, do you remember the such and such meeting we had with so-and-so? And you go, not really. And then they say it in a different way. They say, we had a meeting with so-and-so, and you sat on a blue sofa, and you sat next to the woman with the red dress, and someone spilled coffee on, oh yes, now I remember the whole thing. 
because they fill in enough detail that all of a sudden it triggers your, your memory and you go, okay, now I remember, now I can picture the scene. And so a couple of people testified after I did and they testified that I had been at a certain meeting that I hadn't recalled and that I had said this or that with some great specificity. And all of a sudden it was like the story I just recounted. I remember the blue sofa and the red dress and spilling the coffee and I said, yes, I was at that meeting. They're right, I was wrong when I said I don't remember that such a meeting. And then I felt compelled to amend my testimony to say, yes, in fact, I was at that meeting. I've now been reminded by so-and-so who just testified, and that's completely permissible under the rules of the, of the house. There's a process for it. I did it. And of course, the press made a huge to-do about it, that I was lying. And then when I was caught lying, I changed my, no, I, I was reminded, and I was very forthcoming about it. So, so it's interesting to me in the book when you talk about, and I'm going to come to your questions in just one minute, but you talk about getting on the plane after your testimony, getting to Dallas. There's a reporter who actually buys a ticket to be on the plane with you on the way back, and people are greeting you and thanking you for your testimony. I mean, it was pretty surreal walking through Dallas on a very, very busy evening. It was a 6.30 p.m. flight, so you can imagine how busy Dulles was. And I literally, from the moment I got out of the car, all the way through to the gate, I mean, hordes of people were high-fiving me or whatever. And I get on the plane, and I'm finally going, oh, finally I can sleep. I was flying first class. I had a late flat bed, and I was going to go back to work. And this reporter walks up to me in the first class cabin, from CNN and he said, I'm traveling with you to Brussels, do you mind doing an interview? And before I could say a word, the captain and the first officer and the purser on the flight came over, they saw this going on. He came out of the cockpit, we were still at the gate, and he told the reporter to buzz off, to leave me alone, there will be no interviews in the cabin, and he smiled and said, you're welcome. And this guy had basically bought a full fare first class ticket and wound up sitting in his seat I didn't say a word to him the entire flight. There's a funny line where you put your uh, suitcase in the wrong overhead bin or something. Do you remember this? In the uh, yeah, I must, you know, the we first were, class they're assigned to the seat, so I put my suitcase in the wrong bin and the press made a, a huge and deal. You about. said this is typical of the day. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is really a remarkable book. I mean, I can't say enough about it. We have copies downstairs. If you have not picked one up, you need to not leave tonight without this book. And I know Ambassador Sondland said he would graciously sign any, but I did want to leave a few minutes for any questions you may have. So, anybody have questions? I know this group, so. I had a, a, a couple of observations and a question, but sure. When my son and my brother and I were talking about coming, we thought it would be interesting. And it probably be fun, and it was. You made it fun, so I appreciate that. But one of the things that when we spoke earlier, I came in and spoke to you just briefly. And I got to tell you, you know, you immediately said, you know, I'm Gordon. What's your name? And it was impressive because it was it was honest and it was you. So that, that's very cool. Right? You know, the ability to do that is different. For somebody in your stature, it wasn't detained, which I respect immensely. Second thing, though, you were speaking with Sally earlier, and you said the reference to your impeachment. Try, you know, speaking at the impeachment trial, I mean, you had to qualify the Ukrainian one, you know, the one about Ukraine. Isn't that incredible that after 250 years of democracy, all the presidents have had to be able to present the impeachment process? That's incredible. So that's my two observations. The third thing, though, is, and I asked you downstairs briefly, I said, you know, like, reading your book, I can see the empathy, I can see, you know, you're a businessman. I told you I was a lawyer, a real person, doing deals for 35 years. And, I could sense, though, that you were you, you had that businessman one in my mind, but in your process of being an ambassador, the, the human element came in, and the recognizing national sovereignty and then people's lives are at stake with some of the things you did. And it came through that you picked up on that, but my question was about the president, whether President Trump ever got that in his system. Do you think he has it in his system now? Or he's thinking, I think about Ukraine now and the, and the the fact that he was a brilliant move by Putin to invade. I mean, human people are being killed in that invasion. And do you think that he picked up on that? You know, I'm not going to defend his comments because they're not defensible. Um, what I've been very nuanced about President Trump is that the, the level of narcissism 
seems to get in the way of almost everything he does. The old maxim that they teach salespeople, sales 101, once you've made the sale, shut up because you've made the sale. Let the person buy whatever you're selling. Don't talk anymore. And President Trump has a hard time with that. He just, because he always has to bring everything back to himself. And that, to me, is his largest Achilles heel. If he could just be quiet after he made the sale, he would have been far more effective. Do I believe that he is, um, you know, celebrating the death of all these people? No, not at all. Uh, I believe that he is trying to appeal to a certain isolationist base in our party that I think is very unfortunate. They haven't read their history books lately. They need to go back and reread. Being an isolationist yeah, is not a winning strategy. Uh, the fact that Ukraine is not an EU member or a NATO member is neither here nor there. Uh, you know, this is like the car loan that your kid takes out. Uh, when you think you're a co-signer, you're not a co-signer. You're the signer. <laughs> and, 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 we're, and we're the signer on this. Because if Europe were to be overrun by Russia, hypothetically, uh, it's $800 billion a year in trade. It's an enormous amount of military and strategic assets. We have no choice. And I advocated as soon as this started that the EU should create some kind of a special category for Ukraine, admit them immediately with a set of things that they have to do over the following two or three or four years, or they get kicked back out again. But get them in immediately. And the same with NATO. So you think Ukraine is a stepping stone to the rest of Europe, potentially to the sky? Without question. It's a proxy war we're fighting right now. And we're fighting one hand tied behind our back, whereas Putin is using both of his hands. Yeah, no question. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for, I mean, it's very, very enjoyable. Thank you. Um, Thanks for coming. From your perspective, you know, that the 27, 28 tribes in Europe, they are more united now than they ever have been. And certainly the war has united them even more. And I feel that in this country we're getting, what can we learn from the Europeans that we could to be united us like we were, not that we have always been, but, but I, I feel this growing apart in the U.S. Well, hypothetically, and I mean it's a silly analogy, but if Canada were to attack the United States, my guess is the red states and the blue states would be united as well. think we're too far gone. Uh, it's funny, Trump was so transactional in many ways, he was very bipartisan. He would talk and deal with anyone who could do something for him. He didn't have this sort of um, you know, issue that, oh, I don't talk to Democrats because I'm a Republican. If you're a Democrat and you're willing to come to the table with something that would benefit him, or feed his narcissism, he was happy to talk to Democrats and make deals with Democrats. Unfortunately, I think now that President Biden has taken over, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, and of course this is a very biased comment since I'm a centrist to slightly conservative Republican, if you look at a scale of one to 10, five being right in the middle, 10 being an ultra left wing Democrat, and one being an ultra right wing Republican, I'm somewhere in the two to three range. Uh, in my, my own politics. And uh, unfortunately, um, Republicans tend to default more to being willing to work with Democrats than I think Democrats are willing to work with Republicans because to them it's almost emotional. They don't even want to be in the same room with the Republican, uh, especially that group that are in the eight, nine, and 10 range on the scale. They just, whereas the Republicans that are on the 
one range or the two range are more than willing. They think that the progressives are silly and crazy, but they're more than willing to engage. That's what I've found in my 35, 40 years of doing this. I have a sister who's a liberal Democrat. And look, she, I, she gets on her face when she's around Republicans. I don't, I don't have that look when I'm around Democrats. I have a lot of Democratic friends. I was married to a Democrat for 29 years. We canceled each other's votes. Didn't bother me at all. Other questions? Uh, I'd like to ask a non-political question. Sure. OK, so you had the great opportunity of living in Belgium for quite some time when we were working. And um, as we all know, in Belgium, they make the best beer. Do you have a favorite? Did you get oh. a chance to try? You know, I'm not a beer drinker. Oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a scotch, wine, and sparkling water drinker. Those are my <laughs> so, you know, I, I drank a lot of Scottish, a lot of Highland scotch when I was in Belgium. But, you know, everyone who came to visit wanted Belgian beer. So I would have the cook, the chef at the house, keep like six or eight different beers in stock at all times for guests. <laughs> Which I paid for, of course. <laughs> <laughs> part of the 1.2 million. Part of the 1.2 million. Can I just say one thing? Because, you know, the three to sixes, the three to sixes, three to seven in your scale. I mean, yeah. I'm one of those, too. And most of my family is, we've got people on both ends, just like we have eight siblings. So, how do we get, I mean, we're still 60, 65, 70% of the population, but I don't want to speak out because, you know, you're getting chopped, your head's chopped off, and it's nasty from both sides. You know, if you, we speak out in the middle, so how do, we, how do we get the people who really are the silent majority, how do we get back to where we can have the, the, the progress that everybody wants? And I'm not saying progressive, I'm talking about progress that we don't want. How do we do that? Well, this is all a media-driven controversy because when you know the cameras are off and the lights are off and the senators, particularly the senators, wind up going to lunch or dinner, it's very bipartisan. They could sit down and within five seconds tell you the 10 things they agree on. And you would then say, well, then why aren't you, why aren't you working on those 10? Never mind the other 90 you disagree on. Why aren't you working on the 10 that you agree on right now and pass some legislation? And again, that's where the fundraising comes in. This comes in, that comes in. The answer to all of this, I think, at the end of the day is term limits. Um, and I know the arguments against term limits, and I respect those arguments, I understand them. But if, for example, senators could serve no more than you know, two terms, 12 years in the Senate, and House members could serve no more than four terms, eight years in the Senate, you can get a lot done in 12 years. And if you can't get anything done in 12 years, you shouldn't be there in the first place. And once people are limited, you know, all of a sudden it changes their whole perspective. <laughs> The sense of urgency takes over. What's next for you, Ambassador? <laughs> Getting on a flight at 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> no, I'm, uh, Do you want to run for president? The no. is wide open. <laughs> <laughs> I, my dog would vote for me. <laughs> anyway, um, no, I'm, I'm busy in my, in my real life business, and, and particularly on the hotel side. Um, part of a much larger company now, as I mentioned, and on their board. Uh, I'm enjoying the uh, I'm enjoying the book tour. Um, there's talk about a potential TV series, but who knows if that's going to go anywhere? But people are working on it, uh, and so we'll see. Thank you. Thank very you very much. For